if there's a listener out there who is hearing about XG Boost for the first time or getting excited about it uh, as a result of listening to this episode more so than before and they want to try it out, what are the kinds of prerequisites that they need before um, trying XG Boost, you know, for example, by grabbing your book? Yeah. Um, I mean, understanding what you would use XG Boost for it, it, and, and where it's appropriate. So, so generally, this is for uh, um, supervised learning problems, right, where we're trying to predict a label in the case of classification or predict a, a numeric target in the case of regression. Um, and then, I, I mean, I, I, I find myself teaching XG Boost to a lot of people who are subject matter experts, right? So they, they have data, they're subject matter expert about the data, but then they need to make predictions about that data. So the more you can understand the problem domain, I think the better you're going to be able to make a model. It's, it's often be said, and I, I don't, I, I wish I had like someone to attribute this to, maybe, you know, that if you have better data, you can make a better model or a dumber model and will often outperform a super fancy model if, if, if you have better data, right? And, and so certainly you could think of cases where, you know, if, if you slightly improved your data, you could throw it into logistic regression and, and probably do as good as you could with, with a model, maybe like an XG boost model for, for certain situations, right? For other situations that might take a lot of time or effort or, or pre-processing such that you're doing so much processing on the data that you might as well just use something like XG boost because it's kind of gonna do that for you instead. Um, and, and then there there is some minimal level of programming that you, you're gonna have to have. I mean, making making a making a model using scikit-learn or XG Boost is not particularly hard. It's like three lines of code to do that. So, so if, if you can get your your environment bootstrapped or up and running, or you have some you know web web based version of the environment or a hosted version that you can use, it's not particularly hard. But again, uh, there's a lot of the work that you do before making the model and the work that you do after making the model, such that like those three lines of code uh, aren't really important because because of the other uh, right, right, stuff right. that yeah. are, is required. So just like calling a regression model in scikit-learn, calling an XGBoost model is straightforward. It's just a few lines of code. It's actually the same interface. So that because it implements that scikit-learn interface, like mm -hmm. one of the things you can do is is like you can take, you know, half a dozen different families of models in scikit-learn and XGBoost, and if your if your data is sufficiently pre-processed. Again, XGBoost supports things like missing values and, and a lot of these scikit-learn models don't. Um, but if your data is, is, is in sort of this common subset that, that works with those other models, you could make a for loop and just loop over all these different models and evaluate them very quickly and see you know, general performance characteristics of the different models.